This is the Hollywood Outsider, a weekly entertainment podcast where this week we are looking at upcoming releases Flight, Man with the Iron Fist, and Wreck-It Ralph. We're going to have a spoiler-free review of Paranormal Activity 4. The From the Outside In topic this week is some listener Halloween suggestions, so that'll be interesting. As always, the latest in movie and TV news, our own trivia and flashback DVD segments, including this week's contest winner. My name is Aaron Peterson, and with me today are my fellow hoes, Brian Williams. Hey, what's up, Aaron? Much, Brian. Justin McCumber. What is up, brother? Not much. And Scott Clark. What's up, man? Not much. How is everybody doing? Apparently, you're not doing not much. <laughs> Good call. Um, we have our Rocky Horror screening, Rocky Horror Picture Show screening is confirmed. That'll be uh, happening on the 30th. If you listen to this after that, you can't come. <laughs> so, and you didn't buy all the tickets yourself. And you didn't buy? No, I did not. They've actually been bought by many, many people. I think yeah. we have like 40 left as of this recording. Yes, that's pretty exciting. We're hosting our first screening, if anybody didn't know. Go to the website and you can see. If you like the Rocky Now, Horror are you going to be doing it in full drag regalia? If I mean, we, are you going to be Frank other, Converter? Otherwise known as what? Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. If, if He's we, like, oh, this, this fishnet again. Gosh. If we sell out, know, maybe. I don't know why HR has such a problem with me dressing like this. <laughs> <laughs> what is the complaint? I don't understand. I actually offered. I asked. I said that... If we sold it out, I'd, I'd dress up, but apparently that was a bad idea. So Because it's not really encouraging well, it, it was how, It was yeah. the enthusiasm with it that scared them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, I should say, maybe I should say, if we sell out, I won't dress up, otherwise I'm going to. And get, I think that would work better because yeah. he's he just came at me like, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll dress up. Yeah, it's that's like, exactly dude, no, how I nobody did. was asking about that. <laughs> no, nobody brought that up. <laughs> nobody. Uh, and also, if you check back, our Paranormal Activity spoiler cast will be up before Halloween, probably up on the... 28th or 29th we'll we'll see when it goes up but that's coming soon so listen for that that's a lot of fun you guys ready we'll just jump right into movie news sure let's get moving. Bring it. okay the first thing is first warner brothers has bought the rights to mickey spillane's mike hammer to turn into a possible film series yeah the distressing part of the article though is that the, it seems like they're wanting to turn this into an action franchise do we really need another action franchise i think i would much rather have a detective you know a hard-boiled film noir style movie rather than yet another action movie series am i alone in this would you i know there there's some speculation as to uh which direction they want to go whether they want to keep it in that that time period that mickey spillane was i guess I guess it was, um, what, 40s? Mm-hmm, something. Well, yeah, yeah they, they said they don't know if they want to keep it back in the original time period that, that the books are written for or bring it into a contemporary setting, but it's an attempt to build an action franchise. That's what bothers me more than the setting. You can do contemporary noir or 40s noir, but don't have this guy kick in five people's asses at the same time before he jumps into his muscle car and rips through the streets of wherever i would i'm 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 kind of missing a nice noirish detective movie we haven't had one it seems like in a while one that was really kind of gritty and dark i don't know no, I, I, we've got enough action franchises i would like to see something in the vein of like bud from la confidential Right. Uh, you know, in the spirit of a hard-boiled, real noir. I get what you're going for. And or I, a Chinatown. You know, ooh, something like that. Even better. With less incestuous relations. Yeah. Well, you know, that's... <clears throat> keep it in the family, that's up to you, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I found it interesting that uh, Ian Fleming said that this character was a base, was inspiration for James Bond. That, that actually piqued my interest in reading the article a little bit, because uh, especially that and, and him about... Uh, having an impatience for the legal system from what I read, mm-hmm. like a, like a dirty hairy kind of thing, right? Oh, very much so. Yeah. He was kind of like the the hard nosed PI. Now, now would you consider those straight up action flicks? I mean, that, I mean, there was, a, there was some action in it, but I didn't get the, in what dirty jump. hairy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, they're similar in vain and yeah, I would consider them action flicks. There's more action than not. Uh, but is that the kind of action that you're talking about, Justin? I mean, you, you sound like you're, you're talking about like a just straight up action, all balls to the wall. Kind of thing. Well, that could... seems to be what today's action movies are. Right. I mean, back in the 80s or 90s, <clears throat> well, maybe not even really the 90s, but 70s and 80s especially, your action film would just be a crotchety dude shooting people. Now it has to be him shooting lots of people while performing parkour 
and then leaping into a vehicle and speeding off for a, a high speed chase. It's it's your your action star today has got to have a, a l- much larger repertoire of abilities than Dirty Harry had to have. Right. I say just give it to Liam Neeson. <laughs> Fuck it, yeah. Just right now. Let him do it. Because <laughs> he does have a particular set of skills. <laughs> Very specific. Very specific. Very specific. Not special. Yes, specific. not special. If anybody noticed that when we did the Taken episode, I named the episode a special set of skills. And it was supposed to be specific, but by the time I put it up, I realized I did it wrong and it was too late. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry if anybody was yelling at the They do iPod. know, but they do now. They do now. Uh, Paranormal Activity 5 has been given the green light. Now, obviously, we're going to review the fourth one here pretty soon. As well as the Spanish Paranormal Activity is going to be on theater screens. They're estimating, hopefully, by spring 2013. Yeah, obviously these are just, they're just cranking these things out. I mean, the four movies combined, the total budget for these things has been $8 million. Yeah. They have grossed, they have made over $575 million. Hmm. You don't get better profit margins than that. No. <laughs> I don't care what, I don't care what business you're in. Uh, so it's no surprise that they're, they're cranking these things out just like they're, you know, on, a, on an assembly line. So it's, you've got everything in place. You've got low paying, low paid actors. You've got the basic plot, low, low special effects costs. I mean, it's 80% of these movies are already made. So why not just tack on a little bit extra, tweak it here and there and, and do it. But um, it's, I don't know. It's, I'm kind of more curious about the Spanish stuff. The, uh, the, the Latino, uh, uh, spin off of it. I'm kind of more curious about that than than uh, Part five. number five. What I'm wondering is if at some point do they just start putting cameras in Walmart parking lots and we'll just start assembling film from that? <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just add like a bump every now and then, like, ooh, did you hear that? <laughs> That's <laughs> what happened to these people. <laughs> now you know well, where the demons came from. I was telling the guys uh, earlier. Aaron, before you got on, that apparently, and not none of us knew this, but back in 2007, um, no, I'm sorry, in 2010, there was actually a Paranormal Activity 2 Tokyo Night film made. It was so hard for you not to say drift right there, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. I, I just wanted <laughs> to say Tokyo wanted... <laughs> Drift. But it, it was a 2010 Japanese film written and directed by Toshikaza Nagi, but it was commissioned by the Japanese based on the 2007 film the the first paranormal activity but it was only released or at least it it, it seemed to be only released over in japan oh wow i didn't i had no idea about that i didn't either never heard of it but yeah it exists it's out there i actually wouldn't mind seeing that my brother thinks he's japanese so brad if you're listening to this find me a copy of that i, I want to see it <laughs> yeah a, dub it, it translate it as they go i don't want to be reading yes dub it for me reading is for losers <laughs> Uh, we talked a little bit about this before at speculation, but it's been confirmed. Michael Fassbender is attached to Sar in Assassin's Creed, the movie, for Ubisoft and New Regency films. Now, we know we did talk about this before, like Aaron said, and not too much new to say other than it, it's a reality at this point. It's got the studio. It's got the um, that kind of thing. Um, with a big-name actor like Michael Fassbender, I think this could make our first like video game movie that actually works. I'm a hoping at least, but it's I, a I great just, story. Yeah, it, it really cool is. Um, I just I'm I'm not getting too excited just yet. I, I kind of want to see. You're it. not. It's a video game. Scott. I'm, I'm excited, but I'm. Cautious. How do you not have wood right now? <laughs> <laughs> because they always, they screw every property up when they do, when they do a movie. But, I mean, from from the original Super Mario Brothers, it's just they they just never work. Um, but something like this that that looks like to be taking a serious route with it and getting a big name actor, mm-hmm. it, it it could be something. I just I'm just cautiously optimistic. I use that phrase a lot, but it it, it it's I don't want to be disappointed, so I'm trying to hold back my excitement for it a little bit. Eh, that's fair enough. But I, I hope he's running around the studio with that freaking hoodie on right now, just <laughs> just pretend stabbing people. I do I do like the casting for that. I think that I think, that works. I think it's great. Michael Fassbender is definitely the guy you go to for uh, franchises right now. Because so. I mean, he's going to have to play. I mean, at least if it follows the games at all, possibly two, three, maybe even four different characters. Um, I don't know if they're going to make this into a trilogy, if they're going to, you know, wrap it up in one. I mean, obviously the success of it's going to kind of warrant that, but I- I'm interested. I just I just don't want to screw it up. We'll see. We'll see what happens. 
Johnny Depp is in talks to star in Transcendence. The plot centers on a man who creates a computer that develops malevolent awareness. What's interesting about it is that it's going to be the directorial debut of Oscar-winning cinematographer Wally Pfister. He's that guy that bitched about Joss Whedon last week. Um, <laughs> and produced by Chris Nolan and Emma Thomas. All three also hitched up for Inception, Dark Knight Rises, etc. Um, Wally's actually worked on every Christopher Nolan film. So that's a pretty unique pedigree for this. Mm-hmm. Well, and apparently Toby Maguire and James McAvoy are in the running for the uh, other lead and Christoph Waltz has been offered a, a supporting role as well. So it's an interesting cast, but given that asshole is going to be directing this, my, my desire to see it, you don't talk bad about Joss. I'll, I will come find you and I will kick your ass. <laughs> we gave this to Justin because he's the only person that would find something horrible about that pedigree. I was going to say. <laughs> Fuck him. Fuck him in his opinion. He, uh, for those that don't know, last well, week. Well, that'll, he... re- that'll really get us kicked off YouTube. <laughs> yeah, good job. <laughs> Again, um, for those that don't realize, Wally last week complained about Joss Whedon's filming of Avengers, saying that basically they just shot the film to show the fancy sets and not to actually tell a story. And, what? Uh, yeah, it, it was pretty silly. Even outside of a, being a Joss Whedon fan, that just doesn't make any sense. And Joss Whedon actually took the classy approach and just said, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm a fan, which normally he would have something smarmy to say. I was kind of disappointed this time, to be <laughs> honest with you, but... But this film sounds interesting because, I mean, you're pulling in Johnny Depp. Um, there's no denying that Wally has a great eye. He does have a great eye, and you can't either, Justin. You've, you've no, worshipped him before. Beautiful. Uh, Chris Nolan, he's behind it. He, he gets very involved in all of his projects. I mean, he's shepherding the, the Man of Steel film as well. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot of talent behind this. So whatever happens with it, even though Justin will be bitching and screaming up until it's released, I think he'll like it. <laughs> yeah, there's too many good ingredients in all of that just to make me think that it's not going to produce something fantastic. Yeah, something that'll make Justin and Brian squee simultaneously is Justice League is getting a summer 2015 release. It's also the same summers as, as Avengers 2. So it looks like they will be doing a ground-running film just like Brian thought they would. You know, I hate to say it when I'm right. No, but, you don't. No, you don't. I, I don't. You're right. I don't. I love it. I, I love rubbing that shit in. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a second here, just in a, you know, a moment of silence here. Just drink it in. Drink just, to, it in. just to bask in my glory. How do, how do you so, feel about that now that they're actually announced that that's the direction they're going to go? I, honestly, I'm fine with it. It's it doesn't bother me one way or the other. A lot of people do get riled up that they've got to do it just like the Avengers, but then we'll turn around in just about the same sentence and say, well, they've got to do something different because otherwise they're going to be compared to the Avengers. It's a it's a really fine line that they're walking, especially releasing the same year. I still think it's it's probably the better idea just because you have the 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 core characters of the of the Justice League that are well known. Mm-hmm. They're most people just know, they may not know the total backstories. They may not know where they're all of their origins, but they can look at Wonder Woman and know who she is. They can point at look at Flash and say, OK, that's Flash. That's Batman, Superman. All of these characters are well just ingrained in our psyches. So I think that that Justice League is in a more of a position to do this than the Avengers. Now, is it the right decision? We'll have to wait to find out. But I'm excited that they're actually moving forward with it. They've got dates slated. I'm, I'm, I just can't wait to see this uh, see this ball get rolling. And just to clarify, um, when I say hit the ground running for those people that aren't familiar with this, Justice League is the DC version of the Avengers with Batman and Superman like he was talking about. And th- instead of doing um, origin stories for each character, they're just going to start a film and assume you know who these characters are for the most part. Now, I wonder, though, if they're going to try and pick someone to oversee not just the Justice League, but the movies that will inevitably spin off from it. So I kind of have to wonder if maybe someone like a Christopher Nolan or something like that might kind of just, you know, not just do the first film, but maybe oversee the rest. I like what Nolan is trying to do with Superman and what he did with Batman, so he would be a good choice, but... It's really all going to depend on who they get to to shepherd it along, as well as the other films. I'm kind of curious if they're still looking at Ben Affleck though to direct the Justice League film. That would be interesting. I think it'd be a cool choice. He's he's denied. He said he's he's not going to do it. Really, he's publicly said it. 
So unless unless they move the Hall of Justice to Boston, I don't think that shit's happening. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> meanwhile, hey, park the car, Batman. Hey, hey, hey meanwhile, kid, uh, what's, you know, park the car. <laughs> I don't know what you started with, but at least you ended I don't know with either, but it got <laughs> twisted up in my head about midway through and just totally fucked that up. Yep. So, so you see that there's not going to be... I to everybody for wasting their, their time with that. So we're not going to do origin stories as in full-length movies beforehand, like you right. said, but right. is there going to exactly. be any origin in the... Well, I'm sure they'll, they'll do some quick thing like, hey, I'm from Krypton. Oh, yeah. That could that could be a long movie if you... I mean... You no, know. They'll, they'll cut to it. They'll just, they'll just assume that you know who they are, or they'll give a quick one, three, four sentence backstory. Right, I'm yeah, sure. That's I mean, how you, it could, you could have a, a news, like a, a ten second news scene there, where some news guys going, and Superman saved uh, two hundred passengers from you know uh, from, of a train wreck, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the the Kryptonian alien, you know who's been America's top defender for the last twenty years or whatever, blah 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 blah. Oh, just Brian's already wrote it. Dude, I've I've been working for like the last thirty years on this. So, and when when Aquaman shows up, they all turn to him and go, "Why are you here?" <laughs> Just say it, man. If you got some shit going on in the water, I can help you out. Put him back in the water. He's dying. <laughs> okay, last real quick piece of news: Reservoir Dogs is returning to theaters for a one night only showing on December fourth, and Pulp Fiction will follow two days later on December sixth. We don't we don't really need to talk about it. Just thought we'd let you guys know if you're Tarantino fans. Welcome to Brian's Trailer Park. Let's get this out of the way first. Someone here is about to pee his pants in anticipation over two words. Tree rape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, folks, if you aren't aware, The Evil Dead uh, is being remade and releases April 12th of 2013. One day before my birthday, by the way, just, just mm-hmm. saying. So I know what I'm doing that weekend. Uh, this one doesn't look campy in the least, and it looks very dark and twisted. Uh, definitely look up this. Go to the go to our uh, website and check this one out. This is definitely uh, kind of dark. So, uh, Aaron, since you're dying to get in here, why mm-hmm. don't you fill us in on the basic plot and just kind of tell us just how aroused you are to see some uh, tree rape action? Oh, let me tell you, the original Evil Dead is one of my all-time favorite films not horror films just film it, it's the one movie that scared the piss out of me when i was a kid uh doesn't hold up as well today if you watch it today you'll just start laughing and be like really but but the story i love this the story is very simple a bunch of kids go to a cabin now keep in mind this is before everybody went to a cabin <laughs> the, they find a book called the necronomicon of course some moron starts reading from it even though everybody's like well you should probably shouldn't do that and you're like fuck that i'm going <laughs> reads from it demons come up demons from the woods they fly in uh very extremely low budget the camera angles were just off the charts crazy uh there is a tree that rapes a lady you can't believe it until you see it i'm telling you go watch the original and you'll be very creeped out and a little aroused it, it's it's an odd feeling the the blood spatter the the violence the gore i mean it's a heavy duty horror movie of its time unfortunately you know not so much anymore but this, it's a red band trailer, so if you go to the website, keep in mind that it's it's very bloody. There, there's a lot of blood showing. I mean, they're incorporating the hand, the possessed hand, that was part of Evil Dead 2. Um, they're incorporating the tree violence, it looks like. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to have the tree rape, and it's probably a little sensitive for today's audiences, but... Aaron actually made me watch this movie like 10 years ago when I first met him, and... Um... And he, what I like about this trailer is that it looks like they're carrying some of that stuff over from the first one very, very well. You you showed me like some of the cinemato- cinematography they did where he does the camera through the woods really quickly or the spiraling, mm-hmm. and they do that in the trailer. From it was Sam Raimi that did the original, right? So, yes, right? Sam Raimi. Yeah, and the, and there's it seems like they're holding true to that, and they're not holding back at all. At least in the trailer I saw, I I'm intrigued. It looks like they could have pulled it off. They I really, Bruce worried. Campbell did a, a Comic-Con appearance and they showed the trailer. I don't remember which con it was. I think it was Comic-Con. And he promised that they're going to hold true to the gore. Now, Bruce Campbell, for people that don't know, shame on you, but he was the original star of the of Evil Dead. He has become famous for playing the character. The movie's made zero money, but they are cult phenomenons. He's become a, a cult phenomenon sort of himself. He promises it's going to be just as true to the true to the nature of the original film. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be violent. It's going to set new standards. Now, they always say that this is a hype machine, but what I saw in the trailer looks to be a bloody, violent, evil dead remake. It mm-hmm. doesn't look like they're 
lowering the bar. And the fact that Campbell's behind it, Sam Raimi's behind it, they handpicked the director, they handpicked the script, they handpicked the stars. I have more faith in it than I do a normal remake. So is he pro- helping producing it? or Yeah. Oh, okay. Campbell and uh, Sam Raimi own the rights. That's awesome. So. Well, all righty then. So uh, following Evil Dead's April release is the apparent kickoff to the superhero summer of 2013. May 3rd, 2013 is when we get this shit to crack in Iron Man style with Iron Man 3. In what appears to be the edgiest Iron Man movie to date, Guy Pearce and Ben Kingsley joins the usual cast as villains this time around. And as this really doesn't need too much of an introduction, I do have one question. Now, I could be wrong here, but didn't the reps, you know, whether it was the studio or, or Marvel, I'm not sure which, but didn't they swear that the Mandarin was not going to be a villain, but it was just going to be like some sort of nanotech villain instead? I, that or, seems to be what I remember. Yeah, that's what I remember you know, too. But if you know who the Mandarin is, the the Mandarin, for those who don't know, is basically in the comic books, Iron Man's one of his largest villains, one of his biggest foes there. So uh, there was all the speculation that he was going to, and then he wasn't, and it looks like he's obviously in here. Well, in a weird kind of way, he was also in the first film, not physically, but the terrorist leader, when you looked, uh, there were some shots in their camp, there was a banner, and on that banner were ten rings, and those rings yeah. all had the symbols from the Mandarin's rings, which in the comic book, he got those rings from an alien ship that crash-landed, and it gave him, like, invulnerability. Um, so when the first film came out and those ten rings were up there, there was some chatter, you know, amongst us geeks that this was a reference to the Mandarin in some way that maybe these terrorists were being backed or paid by him, but now he's making a full appearance. Whether or not those rings are still going to have any kind of special ability, I don't know, but I, I got to tell you, I watched that trailer and I just got goosebumps mm. up my back because it looks incredibly dark tonally yeah. as well as you know just on a graphic level it, it it makes the first two films almost look shiny and and happy and i love that i love that they're really taking this to a deeper place than the other two and he says right off the bat you know after new york everything changed and i'm glad that the avengers storyline and what happened there is going to carry forward and have ramifications it looks utterly phenomenal shane black looks like he's done a an amazing job. April cannot get here fast enough. How cool does Guy Pierce look too? He just he just looks so evil in the trailer. I mean, he, just he looks in great. limited limited portions there, and, and and some of the most amazing action scenes I've seen in a trailer in a long time. I mean, outside of maybe Avengers and, and Batman, but there's just there's just stuff blowing up and <laughs> it big looks fun. Pieces. I do have. I think it looks fantastic, so I, I want to preface that. I'm not trying to say anything negative, but I am. <laughs> yeah, but I will. Fuck you. Um, the <laughs> the the thing I get concerned about was the first two films, and I don't care what people say. I like the second one. I, I didn't think it was nearly as awful as people thought it was. I didn't either. Um, so why people felt that way, but whatever. It, they were both fun. The first two movies were fun. This one looks great, but it looks like a different kind of movie. Does that make sense? And, and well, I guess you did say that you were talking about the first two are very shiny and this one looks darker. I think it's great that they're going to that place. I get concerned that it's not going to be as fun as the first two. I, I just want to, you know, if you want to go to a darker place, that's great. But keep what made the first two work so well intact. I can agree with that. I'm hoping that it's not a constant stream of doom and gloom. But uh, Iron Man and Tony Stark do have a lot of darkness to them. And I think that. You, that has been kind of ignored in the movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, his alcoholism especially has been almost completely ignored in the film. So to start drifting him into a direction that brings in some of the comic books, um, darkness of the character into the films, I, I, I like. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would still like Tony Stark to have some good snark. And for there to be a little bit of comedy, I can't imagine that there won't be, but a little more edge would be nice. Because as much as I did like the second one, like you did, I, I liked it quite a bit. I, I did kind of regret that um, the Whiplash character 
would have gotten to be a bit more edgy and dark than they ended up letting him be in that film. So this may kind of deliver on some of that promise that the second one didn't quite deliver on as far as some tone. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I got a question for you. How much can you get done in one day? (laughs) It was, it's rhetorical. Don't worry about answering. Uh, (laughs) Don't need paper. Anyway. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. No boxes are being drawn this time around, guys. Damn it's it. okay. Relax. I was already starting to draw my box. <laughs> um. uh, you'll have to do some research to catch that joke if you're relatively new to the podcast. But anyway, uh, Mansoor Oscar travels around via a limo, changing lives, his own lives, basically about nine times in a day. Holy Motors, uh, which is the movie that we're talking about here follows Oscar around for one day as he makes nine different appointments. He transforms himself from a captain of industry to a beggar from a ninja warrior to a, a fashion model kidnapping troglodyte. So this would be a hands down most original movie of the year candidate, if not for cloud Atlas. If you want to see the latest in film noir romance, monster movie, futuristic sex fantasies, <laughs> <laughs> then check out Holy Motors on November 9th, 2012. Now, guys, did this scramble your brains at all? Justin, this trailer? Go ahead, Justin. Well, I'm the one who asked to, to talk about this trailer, and only because up until recently, I had never even heard of this film. Um, but when I read a couple of articles about Cloud Atlas, this film was also mentioned as one that had um, a lot of range to it a lot of audacity to the style and that it was kind of a an under the radar phenomena and when the or phenomena when the trailer came out phenomena. and i phenomena we're all thinking it <laughs> when i saw the trailer it for the first probably third of it i was like oh really this is what everybody was kind of raving about but as it went on and i kind of saw what they were doing and it got a little sillier and, and more things came in i was blown away when, when it ended i really thought now this looks like one of the most unique unusual audacious films i've ever seen put in a trailer i want to see this film uh, i i don't expect to be touched by it in the way that maybe a, a cloud atlas would but it's an interesting film but i think it's a film that not a lot of people are talking about because it is a french film and i want to do my part to make sure that people know it exists and to maybe take a look for it if it they happen to see it in their uh area go take a look it looks odd as hell but it looks interesting and fun and unique we need more of that and that's it i think it looks like the fountain part too Oh, please. The Fountain had such a, and I like the Fountain actually, but the Fountain had a very dark, dour tone to it. This film was really silly. No, there was a lot of silliness, at least in my opinion. Man, I must have not seen the same trailer. No, yeah, the, I, no, I agree with you. The The scene where he's the, the hunchback looking guy, or whatever, comes bouncing out of this this fashion shoot where the green suit and the, the contact lens, it's you know, whiting out his eyes, all limping, all funny and stuff. And there's some, there's some freaky stuff going on here. There's some funny stuff going on, some uh, emotional scenes. I I, got to agree with Justin. I'm probably not as amped to see this as Mm -hmm. Justin is, but if for no other reason, the, the originality of this movie alone is, is enough for me to go check this out. If it even comes anywhere close to where I live, but Oh, I'll That's definitely, probably not going to happen. I'll definitely check it out because it does look unique. I'll, I'll give you that, Justin. It looks very unique. Visually, it looks amazing. Story-wise, I couldn't tell you what the hell it's about at all. And mm. it, not even not even an idea. And it, I don't like movies that are just strictly visual. And it's got to have a little bit more to it. And at this point, I don't see anything. But I definitely will check it out because the visuals are sucking me in a little bit. But it looks kind of weird. Yeah, I'll wait to hear what you guys think about it before I... I don't really have any interest. It's even part musical, Scott. <laughs> There's dancing. Phenomena. Look, what more do you need? Phenomena. Phenomena. All right, guys. We watch these trailers and those from recent episodes at thehollywoodoutsider.com. And we want to know which, what you want to hear us talk about. So if you got any ideas, definitely let us know. Uh, you can let us know on Twitter at eight at uh, H underscore outsider. 
Go to facebook.com forward slash the Hollywood Outsider and click the like button. Leave some comments. And of course, you can always email us at feedback at the Hollywood Outsider. And don't forget, you can get your I'm a Ho t shirts at the Hollywood Outsider.com. Stump the Ho. Stump the Ho. Each week, one of our hosts poses a trivia question to the remaining hosts and attempt to stump their fellow hoes. Hoes meaning Hollywood Outsider. This week, we actually have a listener's question. So, you guys ready? Ready and waiting. All right. Uh, this is from Dustin. And Dustin wanted to submit this question because we were going to talk about Paranormal Activity 4. His question is, The Blair Witch Project was filmed in eight days with eight additional months of post-edits. The initial investment of the film was $25,000. It was released in July of 1999, making $1.5 million on opening weekend. Since its release, how much money has The Blair Witch Project grossed worldwide? A, $96 million. B, $164 million. C, $207 million. Or D, $248 million. Scott. I'm going to say C. Scott says C. Justin? I'm going to go with B. Justin says B. All right, Brian? I'm going to go with D, 248. All right. We'll find out the answer a little later in the show, and thanks, Dustin, for the question. Now let's go to the big screen where we review any new releases this week. There's only one we're talking about, and that's Paranormal Activity 4. Justin, what is this deep, deep story about? Well, finally in the Paranormal Activity series, we're actually going forward in time as opposed to the previous two films, which have taken us successively further backward and backward. So this one is the first film to actually kind of full film-wise anyway, follow up the original Paranormal Activity film. Uh, in this movie, it starts off with a little bit of information where Hunter and Katie have disappeared in California, and this film takes place uh, in it was in New Mexico, right? Santa Fe, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And then once that's done, you're pretty much you're watching the film. And it, it, unlike the previous movies, this one seems to mostly be a FaceTime film, whether it's off of people's cell phones or their various computers that are stashed around the house. Uh, this film is mostly done through recordings made by these cameras, and it follows uh, a husband, wife. And their younger daughter, the woman across the street, um, has uh, some kind of medical emergency and her creepy ass son has to be taken in and cared for by someone until she's released from the hospital. This family takes that son in. And of course, in these films, when you take in a creepy kid, bad shit's bound to happen to you and bad shit does start to happen to you. So that's the basic premise of this film. Once the bad things start happening... We're watching different camera views late at night. There are some unusual things they do with this one. There's a, I'll have to ask you, Scotty, you might know this. Does the Connect actually do that? Yes, it does. So that's how it detects movement is through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ultra, it's not ultraviolet, but it's some kind of infrared. Uh, infrared. Infrared. You can see it. You can see it with an infrared lens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, within this film, there are, once they start recording things, they do it through these cameras set up on laptops. And I think he even stashes one camera up in the, the living room that has one of those infrared lenses on it. So you can see those beams that are spreading out. And if things move through it, that shouldn't be moving through it. So let's start first off with the, um, the story. Did you guys feel like this followed up the first film well enough and to a certain degree second and third film or did you wish the story had gone different ways let's do try and be spoiler free i thought I mean, I, yeah as far as timeline wise i thought it, it kind of flowed fairly well i like that they did give the quick recap uh, i did recently watch the the previous three just about back to back to back so i mean myself i was fairly caught up with it but it was still good to kind of get that little refresher of you know hey what happened where are we at right now so it was a, uh, it was pretty good. The story wise, I mean, it, it, I do like some of the, uh, we can get into it a little bit later with the production stuff, but it was, it just kind of helped. It just kind of flowed along there. There was some stuff towards the end that I didn't care for, but that's, uh, I'm just really not, not too, uh, pleased in general with it overall, overall product, but well, I'll go more into detail on that later. The hardest part with the story is that so much of the story takes place in the last 20 minutes of the movie. Mm -hmm. 
that it's hard to really go in depth into it without spoiling it. You know, you hate to be generic and people are, well, I wish you guys would say a little bit more. Well, if we go too much into the story, we end up spoiling what happens. Right. And, and, we, and we that's have, a big part of it. We've got like three or four brand new characters that you have to, you, you, you have to grow with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And in the previous two, we, we had at least, even though the, in pair number three, where it was, uh, the, the, Katie as a as a daughter, you already knew who that was. You already yeah. related to her a little bit. This is a whole brand new family that we have nothing to, nothing to go on. So you have to build that up, and unfortunately, it's just not it's just not that interesting. Yeah, they don't do as good a job as they did in the, the last one because probably it's because it's a new family and they're starting over. Mm-hmm. In terms of getting you invested in the characters, I do like how they introduce Alex, which is uh, Catherine Newton. She's the teen that plays Alex, and Ben. Uh, Matt Shively, Shively, whatever his name is, he plays her wannabe boyfriend. She looks a little too young to be having a boyfriend and boys in a room. Cause... Wow, you sound like such a dad right now. Hey, man. She was <laughs> I thought little... she looked like she was perfectly dateable aged. <laughs> I don't know what dateable age is, but she looked about 13 or 14. <laughs> I and... thought she looked more like she was about 15 ish. Yeah. Oh, all right. Maybe... You would know. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're such a dad. I am such a dad. But a lot of what the story, a lot of the story context that I want to talk about comes in the last 20 minutes. And I'm not trying to plug the spoiler cast, but we will go more into depth than that. But the story itself is basically they set up the cameras because there's weird happenings. They run into a neighbor boy who's a little odd. He comes in the house and he's creepy as hell. All right, I'll give him that. And obviously, you know, there's some curiosity about his mom and what, what what's her deal and why has weird things started happening since the young boy popped into the house. And then the story evolves from there. I think the story was actually interesting. I just think they didn't do a good enough job of selling it mm-hmm. in the beginning. It took too long. It, it, just, it, it, it did take a little slow. longer than usual. Mm-hmm. I do like that they keep the idea fresh, though. It's not just the same, oh, how, we're going to set up this camera here. Which they did mm-hmm. a little bit of that, but you know, they're doing, they added technology in this one with, like Justin said, the Kinect. And, and, uh, and I was shocked that they actually used the word Kinect. I, I don't know how much, well, Microsoft probably loves free publicity, but... You know, they didn't say FaceTime at all during the during the movie, so I'm assuming Apple said, uh-uh, you got to write us a check. Well, they certainly got a lot of Apple OS showing on that movie. Oh, well, maybe maybe they did get a check. Maybe they just didn't say the name. I didn't hear FaceTime at all. <laughs> but Connect I heard many times. Mm-hmm. Well, the story, unfortunately with this, I felt like there were a lot of areas where they just kind of left. They They included things that either didn't need to be there or they included it because they meant for something to be there, but they never did enough with it. For me, the biggest example of that is the mother and father's falling out with each other. You know, apparently they're not all that in love anymore, yet that really never played into the film in any real significant way other than, you know, a scene of one getting pissed off and walking away from the other and then something kind of spooky happening. Other than that, it's like, all right, you mentioned this multiple times, yet there's really no reason for it. They could have been happily married and it wouldn't have changed really anything mm-hmm. in the story at all. Um, all in all, though, I, I really kind of felt a little let down with the story in this one. This family ultimately is not a part of the family of that Katie and Christy and all the rest of them are a part of. I don't think that their story is going to carry on in the next film at all. And so... I, there could have been, a, a, I guess, a different way to continue Katie and Hunter's story without having to invest in a whole new family. But maybe that's easy for me to say sitting over here. But these films kind of live and die by the performances of the actors involved. If they're believable, we're invested. If they're too acty, then we're not. <laughs> Did you guys feel let down about the acting at all? Or were you pretty well satisfied that everybody seemed genuine? I, I felt they they seemed pretty genuine. I mean, no one's performance really stood out incredibly high or low as far as like really good or really bad to me um i mean kind of the the charm of these movies is that you really feel like you're just looking into into somebody's life you're not mm-hmm. you, they don't feel like they're acting and i and i i thought it was okay the the relationship between um the the, the girl and the and the, the names are escaping me i apologize the young girl yeah the young alex girl, alex and uh and her like you said want to be boyfriend it seemed like genuine conversation that they'd be having over skype or something he's mm-hmm. trying to flirt with her he's trying to Get it on. Trying to see some see some stuff, you know. As, as a he dad, calls that kid cock block. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a dad, I wanted to punch that kid in the face, but go ahead. Oh, like you didn't ever try that. Well, you didn't. As a dad, I said, yeah. not as a teen. 
Uh, I liked Alex. I thought she was really good. Yeah. She, that, uh, Catherine Newton did a really good job, and Matt Shively or Shively, whatever the hell you say his name, as Ben, he was the best part of the movie. Mm-hmm. He cracked me up, and he seemed like a real kid. You know, even though he should have kept his ass, you know, at home a little bit more, and stopped sneaking into the girl's room. You know, and and stopped just walking into their house. Yeah, he's just like walking into their house randomly. Like, dude, I I know what your future is going to be if you don't stop that shit. Knock it off. <laughs> it's going to be short. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but <clears throat> the kids were okay. I thought Brady Allen played Robbie as the the creepy little bastard. He did a good job. The only one that I didn't like was Katie Featherston, because anytime she and it's not a spoiler. It's all over the the trailers mm-hmm. and the TV ads. Anytime she looks wow, you know, since she lost all her weight, yay for her. But I just start laughing every time she does her little slow zombie walk and and she's walking yeah. around, you know. Possessed people can move a little faster. Well, but <laughs> she's in no hurry. Obviously, <laughs> she's like, "I'll get there." Where are you going? <laughs> yeah, she kind of let me down a little bit, but I blame a lot of that though on the the writing and the directing. I'm sure they all told her, "Go slow, look dead faced." Yes, the acting is believable. I mean, it they you kind of feel like you're they're not acting. Which is what you really want with this. It's, you know, like I said, considering the budget, the collective budget of these is an average of two million per movie. So they're, they're, nobody's obviously getting paid a lot of money for their acting abilities. That considered, I mean, they they got some pretty good value in these in these people because they, no, they're not going to win any Oscars for their performances. But for the most part, they're believable, mm-hmm. and that's I just. They're not, and they're not distracting. You know, they're like that quarterback that's not good. Just, just don't throw interceptions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just manage the game, and we'll win this. So that's kind of how I, I see these people. It's just they're okay. They're not great, but they're not distractingly bad either. So that, and that is a for me is a major plus. So uh, I, I actually kind of like the dad. I kind of thought there was a couple times where some of his responses are. Pretty much what I think most of us would do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I got to disagree, but we'll get into that in yeah. more in the spoiler. <laughs> I got more on that too. <laughs> okay. But, uh, so anyway, yeah, overall is all right. Now, the production on these films has never been great because they don't need to be great. You need a house, you need some cameras, and then that's really about it. Of all of them, though, this one really has a lot more special effects going on than any of them, I think, have had. Mm-hmm. And this is the only one of them that could legitimately be in high def. Do you guys feel like this film had, you know, what were the production elements of it, the directing, special effects and all that? Did, you know, do they work for you? Did you think they've carried the tradition on well or do they need to start changing things up? I think it was really interesting how they incorporated FaceTime and PC cameras along with that. Instead of just having, well, we're going to set up cameras randomly, they actually used real technology. And that, to me, worked a lot better than some of the previous incarnations. Like, the, the video cameras of the last one, come on, man. He just, <laughs> he has all these video cameras just sitting around. It just, that one didn't play well, as as well with me. This well, he act- was a video a wedding filmer and a videographer, so it was believable that he had all these cameras. It's less believable that he had all those fucking tapes. Yes. And this one really incorporated modern technology. Everybody has, you know, iPads anymore. Everybody has computers with with cameras in them the connect was genius i thought Mm -hmm. i didn't think they did enough with it i agree they could have done so much more with that but the way that they incorporated it and the way that they some of the shots you you see some of the shots play out and you think it's going to go a lot more dramatically and it doesn't but there's so much potential with how they did that i I would love to see more with with the connect i spent they spent more time like explaining how it worked how it worked and actually using it yeah like (laughs) or or they went too subtle they went too subtle with it well, I, I mean, in a way, do you, they almost had to, because I, well, I don't want to give too much away here, but you know, they they set it up, they set it up, so you're all, you're already looking for it, you know, and mm-hmm. they did show it, they showed it a lot, and maybe they they probably did too much setup and not enough payoff, mm-hmm. uh, because when the payoff did come, it wasn't you know, wasn't yes. as shocking as I would have liked it to be, but you. you they show, it, they show it and they show it and you just kind of – you keep looking. It's almost mm-hmm. like, like where's Waldo? You keep looking for the, the little dots to move yep. and and you don't see it, you don't see it, you don't see it. So they almost have to – I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they went to the well one too many times with the um, setting up stuff. I will say that this is probably my biggest 
<laughs> disappointment in, in an IMAX movie because we actually did see this in IMAX. Yeah, I'd still like to punch Scott in the face for that. That would don't don't look at me. <laughs> that wasn't my call. <laughs> but um, uh, according to according to our uh, coworker or co mate, he said it was your call. No, no, no. Uh, I'm just we'll, saying. We'll John that Tom totally said it was Scott's call. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, but biggest waste. Number one, nobody else wanted to see this in IMAX, and the biggest appeal for these movies is seeing it with a crowd. And there was, what, nobody. 15, 20 people there in there? There was nobody. And, and the few people that were in there were, were teenagers that were, that were talking through the whole thing and, and mm-hmm. bitching and whining, and, and that just really ruined the experience. We talked a little bit about that last week with what ruins mm-hmm. movies for you, but um, the, the picture was, was grainy anyway because it's supposed to be. It's supposed to look like a video camera or from something from your laptop or something. So the clear picture didn't didn't make a whole lot of difference for me. It kind of made the the connect thing pretty cool seeing that on a big screen. That but, was really cool. Yeah, even but even the sound wasn't didn't play that big into it. I would have I would have enjoyed feeding off of the sound of the audience more. Mm-hmm. Um, our buddy that was watching it with us, his reaction made me made me enjoy it a little bit more. But I wish everybody around me was having that same kind of energy, and and it was just just him. It was yeah. There were ghosts in the auditorium because there's so much room. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Just... Nobody wanted to see it in IMAX. <laughs> exactly. Including me. Right. Oh, oh, by what? the way, the the introduction to Robbie in this movie, biggest jump I've ever seen from Aaron in my entire yeah, life. Yeah, I did jump. He jumped about a foot off of that chair, and I'm not even exaggerating. <laughs> I was like, where did that little fucker come from? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and bring this one home. Let's go ahead and do our verdicts. Um, Aaron, you got $1 up to $10. How much would you spend to see this film? Okay, I do like the series. I like the series quite a bit. I, I've really liked the last couple of movies. I thought they were damn near great, honestly. I got a couple of good jump scares, obviously, like Scott was just talking about. And the acting was actually pretty solid, minus Mrs. Zombie Walk. $10 is the full price of admission. I'd give it 6 Scotty, can you do that a little faster? <laughs> I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I, I'd like to think that this formula um, is not wearing thin with with it going into a fourth movie. Because uh, how much I love the first three, but this this particular one seems to be reaching just a little bit too far in too many places for me to give it a real high score. Four out of, four out of ten for me. Oh wow! So apparently the answer to you, Justin, is no, he yeah, can't. Apparently that's a big fail. You know, he had to go longer. <laughs> Brian, what about you? <laughs> okay, I thought they relied on the jump, the the proverbial cat through the window scares way too often. There wasn't enough of the background spooky stuff that that shows up. That's worked so well in the previous movies. I'm giving it a four. I thought this this movie made me want to never watch another one again. Oh wow! I just thought it, it was overall it was it was generally entertaining, but the way I it just the way this franchise is going, I just, I just don't I, I just thought they they they've kind of done this way too. It's, it's the end to, as far as I'm concerned. So, well, I'll see if number five. Of course, I will out of curiosity but that'll be its last chance okay justin last chance you're the only one that might have a chance at going short i give it a five (laughs) i was let down but i'll save the rest of that for the spoiler cast all right that's awesome uh box office paranormal activity 4 opened to 29 million dollars number one for the weekend pretty exciting right it's already made a profit. It already made a profit, except it made twenty million dollars less than the last one did. Uh, interest has declined quite a bit. That's like forty three percent or something like that from from last year. That's a big drop down. A lot of sequels will take a drop. They don't usually take a drop like that. So yeah, there were like ten people in my theater, and this was Friday at seven o'clock at night. Yeah, this is when it's supposed to be packed. I think yeah. next year you'll probably see that cut in half. Hmm. Honestly, Alex Cross opened to eleven million dollars, eleven point three million dollars. Tyler Perry put on a fat suit, put on some wigs. You need to go out and impress people because there's not going to be an Alex Cross too. No, nope. I think it was called Double Cross. Nope. Oh wow, <clears throat> that's the name of the book. I didn't do it. More like crossed out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why can you make stupid jokes like that but when we do? Because um, mine are funny. Argo, in in your mind, yes, they are. <laughs> Argo had the best decline for second weekend, uh, percentage-wise, for any movie playing in more than 3,000 theaters. It only declined 15% from last weekend, made $16.4 million. It's already made $43 million. They're saying it's going to be bigger than the town was, which that, that's a big big kudos to uh, Mr. Mr. Affleck. Justin's up, 
Empire, guys. We've got three films coming out on November 2nd. They are The Man with the Iron Fists, Wreck-It Ralph, and Flight. We'll start off with The Man with the Iron Fists. Uh, the Man with the Iron Fists is a martial arts film directed by the RZA and written by him and Eli Roth. Film stars Russell Crowe, Lucy Liu, Byron Mann, the RZA. So he's actually doing triple duty on this one. David Batista and Jamie Chung. The film was shot entirely in China, including the city of Shanghai. Now, in 19th century China, the blacksmith, played by Reza, is forced to create elaborate weapons of death for a small village. When a traitor threatens to destroy the village, he joins both warriors and assassins to protect their community. Brian, I know you've been a charter member of the Wu-Tang Clan pretty much since <laughs> birth. So, uh, sun you up for a little bit of hip-hop chop sake action? <laughs> uh, you know I'm in. You know I'm in. I, I, I love this, these types of movies. And I'm the RZA. If this movie is as good as the as the trailer is, then I will give all props to the RZA for his uh, apparent uh, career change here. Mm-hmm. So this just looks like a hell of a lot of fun, and I just can't wait to see it. It, it does look intense. It looks like Mortal Kombat for a new generation or something. And it looks really cool. It looks really cool. It's a movie you go to with with a bunch of kung fu loving friends that don't care about plot, don't care about you know anything along that. And all they want to see is somebody getting their ass kicked. That's yeah. it. I, I I was really amped the first time I saw this trailer back when it was released a while ago. I'm not as amped on it as I was. I don't know why because it looks bl- bloody and action and mm-hmm. um I I think I like this in theory. I just worry it's going to be cheesy. I don't know. I, I mean, some of the lines it does are, have potential. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited to see the, the Tarantino one, Django Unchained, mm-hmm. than, than this one. I, like, if I had a, a choice between the two, I think I'd, I'd choose the latter. I ladder. think they're totally different movies, dude. But totally, they're, totally they're kind of the same. I mean... Not at all. You don't no, think so? Not at all. Mm-hmm. No. Well, I think that they're both... They're taking a genre and bending it beyond where it's, it's really kind of gone before. Mm-hmm. And they're both doing it a little bit tongue-in-cheek. So I can see a slight bit of you know, resonance between the two, but I do think that Man with the Iron Fists is much more tongue in cheek than Django Unchained is. But I think this looks really cool. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved watching movies like the 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 kid with the golden arms, um, all those just badly dubbed martial arts films that would come on those UHF channels on Saturdays and Sundays. And this looks to take that formula, but add a a fresh new spin on it. Some really cool music. This looks like a hell of a lot of fun. So I I know I, I definitely want to see it. Uh, And I do hope there is a little bit of cheese. A movie like this should have some cheese. Next up, Wreck-It Ralph. Now, this is a 3D computer animated comedy produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios and directed by Rich Moore. This is actually his film debut. Mostly he's done cartoons on television in the past, mostly The Simpsons uh, and Futurama. Uh, This is also going to be the 52nd animated feature of the Walt Disney Animated Classics series. 52. It's a lot of movies. Wow. Uh, the films are going to feature the voices of John C. Riley, Sarah Silverman, uh, Jack McBriar, and Jane Lynch. The film tells the story of Wreck It Ralph, who is voiced by John C. Riley. He's an arcade game villain who rebels against his role as a villain and dreams of being a hero. Now, obviously, Scotty, you're the video game fanatic. Uh, have you been polishing your quarters to go see this one? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is a movie that's pretty much made for me. I mean, let's let's be honest. I know okay. it's for kids, but I don't I don't care. I, I'm wondering if this could be like the formula that makes a video game theme film work rather than one focus on one property. Mm-hmm. It, it, maybe this, maybe this is the way to go, kind of like uh, going behind the curtain, so to speak, like they did like back in Tron and that kind of thing. Um, I, I will be seeing this in the theater, if nothing, to see how the licensed characters and stuff that they see that I'm going to recognize. And it's, I just can't imagine how much it costs to do. And plus, the inclusion of Jane Lynch in, in there is is awesome in the trailer. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Are either, any, either of you guys at all? I, I'm no, but that. I'll go with you just so I can keep you from acting like a stupid retard. Just so you can scope at <laughs> kids. Yeah, since I get to check out the kids. Yep. How are you doing? How are you doing? Is your daddy here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't have much interest in it other than maybe wait until till video, you know, Blu-ray, something like that. Uh, it's just one of those things to where I don't care about the story. I don't care about the so much the jokes. I just kind of want to see the characters, some of the characters in there. What, you know, which, which, 
little homages do they put in this movie? So that's really about the only thing I'm curious about. Yeah, I don't think video games are as close to my heart as they are you, Scott. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, this is your kind of movie. It's like, it's, seriously, it's like they wrote it for you. <laughs> it's it does look funny, but I don't, I'm worried about how long it, it's how long until it becomes a one note film where the jokes like start getting old and they start getting repetitive. And how many Pac Man jokes can you tell? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We'll have to see. I personally, my only concern with it is that from the trailers, there looks to be a lot of jokes about, you know, the old 8-bit and 16-bit era. I don't know how many kids 15 and under are going to get some of those jokes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I think a lot of it is going to be lost on them. So maybe this is one of those movies that's got enough jokes to please the kids, but enough jokes to please the parents of those kids who get those references that their kids aren't getting and uh i i it does look good though i mean i i was kind of hesitant when i saw the trailer the first time but when it was over i was like yeah they're they're doing a better job of that than i thought they would so i'm i'll see it okay last film flight this is directed by and co-produced by robert zemeckis features an ensemble cast including denzel washington and don Cheadle. um and uh, John Goodman, Flight is Zemeckis' first live-action film since 2000 when he did Castaway and What Lies Beneath. So about 12 years since Robert Zemeckis has done a live-action film. The only other film I, I can even remember him being involved with was that Beowulf, if I'm not uh, incorrect. But live-action, it's been a while. Uh, the film is about the investigation of a pilot's emergency landing, which saved everyone on board. A troubling discovery is made, though, when alcohol in his system is detected, and that might have resulted in that crash. It also might crash land him into prison. <laughs> Aaron already blew, uh, blew my pun load with this one, so I got nothing. You interested in this movie? I am extremely interested in this. I, I saw the trailer. I think it's it's a unique concept. I love Denzel Washington. He can pretty much he could just be doing a serial commercial, and I'd want to watch it. So, the the film. I mean, obviously, it focuses on the actual airplane near crash and how he lands the plane. That's a big focal point. But you can tell the movie's really about what happens to him after the fact and the lives he saved. Was he drunk at the time? Should he be punished? Even though he saved them, he was doing something wrong at the time, possibly. So should he be punished for that? I mean, it's very much a dramatic film. I, I think it's going to be very well received, and it's definitely my go-to film of the weekend. Wow, I just want to see how flying a plane upside down to land it is a good thing. <laughs> like I, I'm... I don't know. That makes me curious, though. I want to see it. Oh, no, no, I'm with you. I'm, that's, I want to go just for that reason. Like, to, How is that going to play out? Because <laughs> when you see that thing in the in the film, it's close to the ground when it's upside down. you got a ways to go before yeah, it's going to be right. By all accounts, up. there's more stuff on the bottom of the plane to protect the passengers than there is on the top of the plane. Right. So you kind of theoretically, most cases, would want that part hitting ground first. I would think, Very but true. I'm, yeah, like you, I'm curious as to where, where they, what's happening to where they have to do that. And you're right, but Aaron, you're right. It's almost like there's, there's, it's almost two movies. Mm-hmm. You, you have that, the dramatic flight and crash, but then you have that investigation afterwards. And, and, you know, like I say, is he drunk? Was, was, was his condition, what put them in the, in that position to where he had to, do something so crazy to save all those people. So I agree with you. This is, this looks really good to me. I'm not quite sure. I'm sold that it's my pick of the week though. I could not care less about this film. Really? I like Denzel Washington, but every time I see this trailer, I get more and more bored by it <laughs> there. I, I don't quite understand why my reaction to this has been so bleh, but yeah, I, if, if, yeah, could, I, I don't know if I could care less if I were Siamese twins. <laughs> I don't even know what, I don't know what that means. Because <laughs> there's, two, there's, of two, of there's two of them. Because there's two oh, of them. Okay. Explain yeah. it to him during the break. I got it. There's two of them, Scott. Uh, we'll draw you a picture. <laughs> All right, guys. So we know which yeah, one he's going to. <laughs> <laughs> November 2nd, three films. The Man with the Iron Fist, Wreck-It Ralph, Flight. Of these three films, which ones are you guys most likely to see? Aaron? I think you already probably spoiled it by saying flight, but I'm sorry. I got excited. Flight. All right. Yeah. But burst your load early once again. <laughs> Story of my life. Brian. <laughs> Man gotcha. with the Iron Fist. Scotty. <laughs> no surprise, Wreck-It Ralph. 
All right. Well, man with the iron fist wins it. Hell that's yeah. what I want to see too. So boom, two against one, one, bitch. All Karate right. Chop. What? Yeah. Well, we'll be back with some reviews for those. That's, but at least we got a good weekend where there's some some different choices that Finally. you want to see different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can always hear us on iTunes, Zoom, Google, or your Stitcher radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you like if you listen to us there, or any RSS feed, as well as RockfordCollegeRadio.com Thursdays from four to six. Uh, what's this movie? What's this movie? Each week we play ours or a listener suggested clip from a movie. If you think you know what the clip is, you email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or send us a direct message on Twitter at H underscore outsider. And we'll give you a, how, a whole shout out next week on the show. Giveaway shorts are a little on short supply, so we're not giving one away for this week's clip. Uh, but you can always buy one at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Last week's answer was Justin's choice, and it was Chasing Amy. And those that got it correct were Ashley, Sue S, Paul S, and Mystery Anyone. Mystery Anyone. I always say that wrong. This week's winner, Ashley. Hey, congratulations, Ashley. You win a I'm a Ho shirt. Now, this week's clip is from my choosing, and it's going to be reflective of Halloween. Now, keep in mind that we're not doing the free shirt on this one, so but please guess, and anybody that gets it cross- correctly, we will give you a Ho shout out next week. Here's your clip. Oh, Stu, Stu, Stu. What's your motive? Billy's got one. The police are on their way. What are you going to tell them? Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. I'm going to rip you up, you bitch! Just like your fucking mother! you got to find me first, you pansy-ass mama's boy! Fuck! Uh, fucking hit me with a phone, dick! <laughs> fuck, where are you? Ah! Ah, you fuck! Ah! Did you really call the police? You make your sorry ass I did. Okay, now let's go to the couch where we talk about TV and home video news. Adam Baldwin is replacing uh, Titus Welliver on Last Ship. It's a TNT pilot based on the novel by William Brinkley about the crew of a naval destroyer forced to confront being the only survivors of a global catastrophe. This is actually the first time I heard this series, and I I, I think it's interesting. It's almost like a mashup of... uh... Uh, Last Resort and Revolution, mm-hmm. a little bit, which is which is kind of interesting. Two shows that that seem to be doing pretty well. Um, I'll, I'll watch the pilot. Sounds interesting. As far as Adam Baldwin, uh, for those that don't know, that's the guy that um, he played Jane on on Firefly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he's a little bit. He's pretty recognizable. Could could be a good thing for the show. I, I'm interested. He, he's probably more well known from Chuck, actually no, nowadays. Well, it depends, but you know, Adam Baldwin's all right, but. It's too bad they're replacing Titus Welliver because what other show is he on? Oh, yeah, he played the man in black on Lost. God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> did a pretty good job. Uh, you're going to make Brian quit. I swear to did God. did a pretty good job. Oh, God. <laughs> as soon as I saw that name, I was like, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go to my Lost. happy place. Go to my oh, happy smash. place. Smash. Network. Uh, I'm sure I will be cut out. That's fine. Let's move on. Network TV ratings are down. Again, viewers are fleeing. Cable is winning. Walking Dead and Sons of Anarchy are routinely beating network shows. Are the days of network TV coming to an end? I hope so. You hope? I really hope so. Because I am. I, what ne- cable television has done is it has given the, the long format that television provides, but it has unshackled it from the idiotic censorship requirements that our networks have to follow. And so now we get a nice long run of shows, but we don't have all that silly dumb shit. We can have shows with some grit, some gristle, a little bit of nudity, a little saucy language. And because more and more people are getting satellite or getting cable, learning about these shows and watching them, they're realizing, hey, all this crap that's over on the, you know, the the regular network channels, that stuff's not as good as it might have used to have been because now I see stuff that's even better. The days of the network TV sh- uh, channels, I think, are rapidly coming to an end. I think that, you know, while, yes, the edgier shows are very popular, and they obviously uh, we're, we are kind of headed towards that direction, I believe there's still a just a much more larger call for for family entertainment, for family, you know, for entertainment that's that's acceptable for all ages. It may be cookie cutter. There may some of these shows may be just just like made on an assembly line or something, but they, there is there is still a spot there. These these 
channels, these network, uh, these network channels are so large, they're not going down anytime soon. It's, there's just no way they might, they might give their content a little bit more edge somewhere down the line, but they're not going anywhere. There's well, no, no not, way. The channels probably aren't going to disappear, but they're going to have to seriously change the way that they do their business. The numbers speak for themselves. Their ratings for the most part are down shows like the walking dead and sons of anarchy their ratings are going up and up and up there may always be a need for family entertainment and that need is never going to go away but i think more people are discovering the offerings that are out there and they're realizing that they're not chained to what cbs abc nbc wants them to watch and these ch cable channels are are reaping the benefits of that i, I have to wonder though how right. much this is driven by things like hulu netflix things like that uh, you know that enable people to watch some of these shows time shifted um and kind of opening up and i think dvr has also helped a lot of people watch shows that they might never have watched before, but now they can because they can just have their TV recorded automatically and then they watch it whenever. That's more of a how we consume it type of thing than actually the network channels, the, the network stations themselves. But how we so. watch it dictates what we watch or how we're watching it is influenced by what we're going to be watching. And the networks for a long time really depended on people being at home, watching their shows when they aired. I mean, how many years did they talk about their Thursday night lineup or their, you know, their Friday comedy, whatever's today. Those things don't matter. People don't sit in, or a lot of people don't sit at home anymore from seven o'clock till nine o'clock mm -hmm. watching those back to back comedies because their DVR is just going to record it, or they're just going to watch it off of Hulu later on. That kind of programming and formatting, I think, is breaking down. And if the networks are going to succeed, and they do succeed in a lot of areas, but there are some areas where they're not, they're going to have to change. How that change comes about and what it's going to result in, I don't know. But they're going to have to react to this in some way. I agree that they will have to they will have to change something to draw in more viewers. I mean that th that's just obvious the way they have to do it. But I still think that everything is not going dark, everything is not going edgy, or everything's not going to nudity and zombies and killing and all that stuff. There's still a need, there's still a major major draw for reality shows, these contest shows like Survivor and the Amazing Race, news special shows like 2020 or or Nightline. Uh, those types of shows, people just, they just, whatever, for whatever reasons, maybe out of habit, if nothing else, they love, they, they eat these types of shows up and medical and law dramas and police dramas. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the bread and butter of network TV. Eventually, obviously it's going to change somewhat the content. I mean, we've made, we've come a long way. There was, what was it? Hill Street Blues back in the eighties was, I believe it was 80s or maybe even early 90s when it was just a, a huge thing because it showed uh, Dennis Franz's ass on <laughs> TV. So we've come a long way, but it's I still I, don't, I still don't see it going anywhere. Will they change the way that they, they that you consume it? Maybe, but for the most part, there's still a major need and a major uh, a major calling for entertainment that's suitable for all ages. Well, now that Brian's done being a cumber for. 45 minutes um, hey, you pull my string bitch. i'm gonna talk obviously the the i agree with you that there's always gonna be a need for some family entertainment and and not everybody wants to see the walking dead not everybody wants to see the sons idiots. of anarchy what's that idiots oh, well, the walking dead is awesome but i think it's it's important to note that the success of most of those shows are the 18 to 49 bracket so older people aren't watching those shows and you still have to have an audience or shows for that audience because otherwise you're just isolating your audience. You don't want just shows, like Brian's saying, you don't want just shows that cater to Walking Dead and Sons of Anarchy fans because then you're not going to have the other shows that actually bring in more viewers but less of that demographic. 
So the reason that the other ones are successful is that those are the demographics that advertisers are after, mm-hmm. not necessarily the amount of viewers. Because a show like Vegas, okay, I, obviously I've become a fan of that show. That show gets better ratings than both of those shows combined. But the advertiser demographic, the one that they're going for, is much, much lower. The 18 to whatever, 30-something. That demographic is very small compared to a Sons of Anarchy or Walking Dead. So those shows actually get more money. It's weird how that works, but that's how it works. Because they figure people that are 80, they aren't changing their habits. They're not going to buy a different pop or soda than they they normally would buy. Whereas a younger person, they'll try anything because they just like the pretty pictures. So that's why those younger shows are successful. Not necessarily because they're better, just because they skewer a younger demographic. Skew. Skew, skewer. I'll say whatever I want. You're sticking it with all a right. long wooden stick or something, or what? <laughs> Am I? All right, all right, Scuttle. Let's. Uh... All right, let's. <laughs> scuttle. <laughs> let's go to DVD and Blu-ray, Scott. We're looking at uh, releases for October 30th, and although there are several releases coming out, we do hope that uh, those, at least those in the area, will not be renting these movies, but coming out and seeing our screening of Rocky Horror Picture Show that evening at Showplace Woo-hoo! 14. Uh, but just in case you're not in the area, not able to do it, you got some here to check out. First is The Campaign. This is a comedy starring Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis as two opposing candidates for Congress. You can hear Aaron's review of that on episode 55. Uh, next up is Safety Not Guaranteed. This is a story of three magazine employees who head out on an assignment to interview a guy who placed a classified ad seeking a companion for time crap, time travel. As silly as that time sounds. Crap. <laughs> I thought you said time crap. <laughs> I, I, I almost did. This actually sounds kind of interesting because apparently towards the two-thirds mark of the film, it, uh, they kind of toy with whether or not this guy's actually crazy or might have actually discovered it. So it looks interesting. Uh, also, Ruby Sparks. This one I'm actually really interested in. A novelist struggling with writer's block finds romance in a most unusual way by creating a female character he thinks will love him, then willing her into existence. It's, it stars Paul Dano, who is a lot of fun to watch on screen. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, a Christmas Story 2, which sounds to be as bad of an idea as it sounds. Uh, This is a direct sequel to the Christmas classic, and apparently it takes place five years after the events of the original. Uh, Instead of a BB gun, Ralphie wants a car. Um, For the most unusual or unneeded sequel ever, Mm -hmm. go for that one. First Position, a documentary that follows six young dancers from around the world as they prepare for the Youth America Grand Prix, one of the most prestigious ballet competitions in the world. And uh, lastly, Coma. A young medical student discovers that uh, something sinister is going on in her hospital after routine procedures send more than a few seemingly healthy patients into comas on the operating table. Uh, uh, Also, Copper Season 1 is available on DVD. Ooh, yeah. Hit me with that unknown shit. Flashback. With that, we'll move on to our Flashback DVD or Blu-ray segment. This is where each week one of our hosts recommends a little-known or obscure film that we hope you'll give a chance. Uh, This week, it's actually my turn. Um, So we talked a little bit about Adam Baldwin earlier. Um, It reminded me of a movie that I liked as a a kid. And most of the movies we recommend in this are either PG-13 or R. And there's a lot of PG movies. And that reminded me of one from 1992 called Radio Flyer. Um, This um, movie is actually narrated by Mike, who's played by Tom Hanks. He's telling his two sons a story uh, that he and his own brother had uh, when they were kids, learning valuable lessons about keeping promises. If it sounds cheesy... It is a little bit, but uh, it, it does get pretty good. Uh, Mike and his brother, Bobby, move to a new area with her mother. Their mother has a new boyfriend, and this boyfriend's played by Adam Baldwin. That's where Adam Baldwin comes in. Um, Adam Baldwin insists, and the kids refer to him as the king. He's kind of a douche. Um, and unbeknownst to the boy's mother, the king is an alcoholic and regularly beats Bobby. So the boys know that their mother's happy with the new boyfriend, and uh, but refuse to tell the police or her. So instead, they kind of uh, do the kid thing and, and, and make their own escapist route and... Um, they decide they're going to build a, a plane out of their out of their wagon, thus the name Radio Flyer, and and fly Bobby away from the abuse. Concept does seem simple, but it, it's very very lighthearted. Um, I got a lot of fond memories of 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 watching this, especially with my brother doing what brothers do. It, it, it's a it's very memorable. Recommend it really highly. Um, I will admit, there's nostalgia plays a lot part of it because I watched it when I was a kid, but it's worth checking out. It's a good, it's a good little family film, and uh, even though it's not on instant stream, you, you can you can find it in some other places like uh, the uh, rental kiosks and that kind of thing. So check it out. It's, it's worth a good look. Okay. <clears throat> now let's go to our Stump the whole answer. The question again was the Blair Witch Project, and this is from Dustin, one of our one of our listeners. The Blair Witch Project was filmed in eight days with eight additional months of post-edits. 
The initial investment of the film was $25,000. It was released in July of 1999, making $1.5 million on opening weekend. That was a fantastic movie to see when it came out. Since its release, how much money has the Blair Witch Project grossed worldwide? A, $96 million. B, $164 million. C, $207 million. D, $248 million. Justin picked $164 million. He's wrong. Uh, Scott, <sighs> Scott picked $207 million. He's wrong. Brian picked $248 million, and he is absolutely correct. Nice, Brian. In the 13 years that's since what he's talking about. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Since the 13 years since it's released, the Bioich Project grossed $140 million.5 domestically and grossed $248.6 million worldwide. They got rich. Now let's go to our From the Outside In topic. We're going to read a listener's email, and they're actually suggesting the stuff we're going to talk about this week. This is, what are you sighing for? I got it wrong again. Oh. It's because you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> It's simple. It's simple. <laughs> Matt Damon. Oh, God, you want to jam it up my ass and twist it? <laughs> <laughs> Can I dip it in some sand first? Oh. I guess. All right. To say that. <laughs> let's, let's start with Ashley's email. I was really bummed to hear how you guys felt about Sinister. My boyfriend and I were really looking forward to it a lot. We did say it was either going to be really awesome or really <laughs> shitty. It's sad to hear that it swayed toward the latter. It was more like average, I would say. Or mediocre. We have decided on your advice. We will wait for Redbox on this one. On a happier note, I think we are going to be checking Cloud Atlas out in theaters. You guys, uh, Justin, sold me on the premise. As for spoiler cast ideas for the rest of the year, I wouldn't mind hearing a spoiler cast about Cloud Atlas. Les Miserables. I can't say that. Les Miserables. Thank you. Django Unchained. The Silent. Or The Hobbit. We are definitely doing a Hobbit for sure. So maybe we could do a Christmas time spoiler cast for all the other ones you're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time, uh, for taking the email, guys. Ashley, here are her topic ideas. First off, as it's Halloween, as for Halloween topics, I have the following ideas: scariest movie moments, not the whole film, just actual moments in films where you literally almost shut it off or needed to walk out of the theater. Justin, um, when I when I was um, a kid. My mother practically refused for me to see The Exorcist. And f in order for me to watch it, I, I practically had to become Ethan Hunt and sneak that thing into the house so that nobody would know the, the schemes that I was up to. And, of course, back then, one TV with one VCR five feet from my parents' bedroom but I managed to get it home after they went to bed. I put it in the player, and Jesus Christ, if not within the first couple of minutes, that thing's scary. But once you get really into it and you're watching that film, when she, her mother bursts into the room and just sees her stabbing herself with that crucifix and shouting the obscenities she was shouting, I almost came unglued right there in that living room. Thank God I didn't wake up my parents <laughs> screaming. I, I managed to at least maintain a little dignity and didn't start screaming like a like a little girl, but it was it was close. Ooh. Scotty? I think that one of the biggest ones for me was uh the the final scary scene in the ring. Uh with with the it's not spoiling it if it's that old, is it? No, it's not with, with that scene when the, the girl <clears throat> Well, it, it was expertly done because you thought the movie was over. You really thought it, you kind of got this feeling that everything was okay, and the kid all of a sudden starts bleeding from the nose, and then you flip to the scene, and, and this girl literally climbs out of the television towards you, and they and they do it so perfectly with the effects. I came unglued on my seat the first time I saw that, and so did the rest of the audience that I was watching it with. That really, really got me going. I uh, To this day, I can still watch that, and it still creeps me out. Brian, you got one? Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those more gory, gross scenes. Was it the Hills Have Eyes 2, where the girl that was hostage was given birth? Are you familiar with what I'm talking yeah. about? Yep, absolutely. Really? I, I've got a pretty good, pretty iron stomach when it comes to gory scenes and that kind of stuff. That really kind of took the cake there, uh, where she... The, the whole giving birth scene there. I'll just explain that. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant. So that was kind of the, one of the first ones I thought about. 
And uh, normally giving birth is such a joyous experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not for some cave dwelling inbreeders. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> my my scariest moment in the film was there's there's a moment you get anybody here ever see Silver Bullet? The, a long yeah. time ago. Okay, it's it's a really old. It's based on a Stephen King short story. Corey Haim and Gary Busey is in it. <laughs> Corey <laughs> Haim. Yeah, it's not a uh, it's not a strong pedigree. <laughs> But uh, who are you, the Fonz? Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> hey, there's a moment in Silver Bullet where Corey Haim's character, who's he's in a wheelchair, he's an invalid, and he's on this bridge in the middle of of the night, lighting up fireworks all alone because it's the only way he could have his Fourth of July or whatever. And this werewolf comes out of nowhere and starts creeping up on him, and then there's an obvious fight as he tries to get free. It's one of the scariest moments I can remember watching when I was a kid. Just because the kid's in a wheelchair, he's an invalid, he can't get up and run away or, or anything like that. It's just the whole the whole way they shot it. It's not a it's great a t- movie. It's a, and it's a tight bridge, too, for those who haven't seen it. It's a really tight bridge, and he's got this souped-up wheelchair that he can't turn around. <laughs> right. It, it was just – it was really intense. And at the time, it just scared the piss out of me because I'm like, oh, shit. And even though you know he's going to get out of it. But the way that they shot it, it just worked really, really well. And it's one of the few movies where I, I really was just at the edge of my seat, just biting my nails. And uh, probably that and the, when you first meet Freddy in, night, in the first Nightmare on Elm Street and he scrapes his finger knives across those pipes. That's probably what the other scariest moment. Oh, I don't know if we can yeah. multiple. I got another one. Sure. Um, it's kind of an easy one. But um, we talked about Blair Witch already. Mm-hmm. But the, the movie was pretty scary along the way. But that last... Scene you son of a bitch. <laughs> where the camera moves over and is moving around crazy and then suddenly fixates on this kid standing in the corner with nothing and there's handprints on the wall. I saw that in the theater and that that was so unsettling, especially for the time because it was like the mm-hmm. first real found footage movie we had, right? Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, that's a big that one. That scene, the, the, there's no soundtrack. There's just silence. You don't know why he's staring in the corner. You don't know what's going on in that kid's head, and they don't ever explain it. That was so unsettling. Awesome. Sorry, no. Justin. No. Yeah, I mean, he, he stole it right out from under me, the very ending of Blair Witch. I mean, you, you, you don't see it coming, and it's one of those callbacks that early on in the film, someone in that area talked about how the person who owned that house would make the kids stand in the corner uh, while they like killed another kid, it's just a, a one-off little bit of dialogue. But then at the very end of that film, as she's rushing through that house, trying to find her friend and get away, and turns that corner, and that split second, you see someone standing in the corner. It's that moment comes rushing back, and it's it only takes like a half second, but that's as long as it has to take. Everybody screamed, holy mm-hmm. shit. You knew what was coming, and bam, it was over. And it just hit you like a Mack truck. And I screamed. Everybody around me screamed. My wife's not seen a horror movie since. <laughs> wow. Don't you miss those moments in the theaters? Like, we're almost desensitized to those as much anymore. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. But when they nail it, I mean, Paranormal Activity came out of nowhere, and that yeah. scared the piss out of That's why people. I love those so much, because you, you get those moments in the theater where everybody else is having that same tension that you are. And it just, I miss that. What about the scariest movies as children? These might not be actual uh, horror, but freak freaked you out when you were young, like fire, like the fire creature scene in Labyrinth. That shit was scary. According to Ashley, I didn't think it was, but Ashley did. <laughs> Scott, you're gonna laugh at both of mine. Probably. Uh, again, these are you know they're not scary movies, but uh, the, when I was a kid, it, this movie came out in what '84, I think. Ghostbusters. What year did that come out, Justin? Ghostbusters. Uh, about '84. Huh? It's got a couple creepy little pieces in it. It's nineteen eighty four, yeah. So I was four or five years old when this movie came out and that opening scene with a librarian that, that turns and uh, roars right. at that scared the piss out of me as a kid and I could not watch the movie again until I was like a teenager. Like oh, wow. and that nostalgia held held in held to that one. The other one, again, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <clears throat> but there was a, a a crappy sequel to The Wizard of Oz called Return to Oz, which was terrible. What the f- <laughs> oh my I know. <laughs> there were again. I don't know remember what year that movie came out, but my dad took me to see that when I was a little kid. And there were these characters called the Wheelers that were I don't even know. They, they looked like strollers with faces on them or something. Those things scared the piss out of me so much. My dad had to make me leave the. We had to leave the theater. It, again, you said ones that didn't necessarily have to be horror movies, and those for whatever reason, those two scared hey, the shit uh, out of me when I was a kid. Go that. 
That fits the bill. Brian? Uh, Poltergeist. That that uh that movie pretty much I pretty much hold it responsible for me being scared of clowns. <laughs> that yep. scene where the kid is uh he's looking he sees the big long arm, long leg blue clown that's sitting on his chair and it's creepy looking just when it's just sitting there and then later, you know, a few minutes later when it attacks him, it's it freaked me out as a kid. And the and magic. I guess something about dolls and dummies and clowns and stuff. But it's the ventriloquist movie from Yeah late seventies, I guess, um, somewhere around there. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's about a ventriloquist dummy that kills his owner or something like that. I don't know. The movie's Shit pretty happens. stupid, but that ventriloquist dummy is very creepy. And when uh, I was a little kid, it was, it was really eerie. Uh, what about my, you, Justin? My brother got one of those ventriloquist dummies when we were kids I would re- I refused to go in his room. <laughs> I think it was I, I couldn't look at it and not think it's about Tell to kill me. Tell me those eyes didn't move by themselves. <laughs> it's about to kill me. It's waiting for me to turn my back and then it is on me like a tick. No. Um prob- the scariest moment I ever had as a child was when the original Salem's Lot television movie came on. And I remember I was at my grandparents' house and I th- we had just finished watching um fantasy island and salem's lot came on i begged my grandparents to let us watch it and they i guess they didn't know what it was about because if they did they probably wouldn't have said yes but they did say yes and i started watching it and it was really a, a creepy movie altogether uh, i i recently have reread the book and when i was reading the scene in the book that was a scene in the movie that's freaked me out so much i almost had to put the book down and it's the scene where this boy is in uh, a, a bedroom and you see through these now of course completely unrealistic but these huge glass these windows looking out at night and this fog kind of rolling in and there's this driving slow beat to the music almost like a heartbeat and as the fog is swirling in suddenly you see this boy floating in the air float up to the window and then just start scratching at it with his fingernails and his eyes are like this yellowish red and he just keeps scratching at it and scratching and the little boy gets up from the bed and of course goes to the window because he's now mesmerized by the vampire eyes opens the the window and the vampire bites him this little boy biting a little boy i was so fucking terrified of that scene i don't know if i slept for a couple of days i could not get in bed and close my eyes and not see that vision of that little vampire boy latching onto another because mm-hmm. I was about the same age as those kids and the idea that my brother could could be a monster like that just terrified me and so even today I rewatched it not that long ago and it still made my my heart pound yeah, it's uh, quite a bit but the the uh, Salem's Lot by far was the scariest. Um, one short other little story about another one. The movie didn't scare me nearly as much as what my uncle fucking did. (laughs) But when I was, again, as a child, we were watching American Werewolf in London. And pretty scary movie. Werewolf movies have always really fucked me up. But at the time, I was living with him and my grandparents. I go to bed. My brother and I go to bed. We're laying in bed, kind of chatting. Neither of us notices that the door opens. My uncle crawls in on his hands and knees, gets to the foot of the bed, and with us not realizing he's there, jumps up and just yells like a werewolf, just as loud as he can, reaching over the bed at us. I swear to God, I probably lost 10 years. I will die early because of what that son of a bitch did. (laughs) And he would not have done it had we not watched American Werewolf in London. Okay. I, I probably have a, 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 a valve not working right because of how scared that moment was. And I will someday pay him back when he is old and infirm. All right. <laughs> that story scared me a little bit. Um, a couple of quick ones. Evil Dead scared me the most. I, I know it's probably, I was a little kid and I snuck it. It was like a VHS tape or something. And I know my mom watched it, and she loved it, but she wouldn't let me. It was one of the few she wouldn't let me watch, which this is surprising. This woman let me watch everything. So I <laughs> That's where you draw the line, huh? Yeah, apparently that movie is where she draws the line. 
So I went and stole the uh, movie out of her, I think it was her room or her friend's house. One of the two. I stole it from somewhere. I, I didn't borrow it. I stole that shit. Watched it and was scared shitless. I mean, I, I had a hard time finishing the, the movie and I couldn't, I did. I, I had to watch it again right away, even though I was freaked out. That's just how I am. So that's one. Something Wicked This Way Comes. I don't know why, but that movie really creeped me out when that came out. It, it's like a Disney movie. Because and you watch it now, and why the hell did that scare me? But for some reason, that movie freaked me out. And the the, the most scared I ever was as a kid, Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D. That thing was in 3D, and me and my, my buddy Dennis went. My mom took us to see it. We're watching it in 3D, and we kept flipping over the seats, hiding under the seats and everything else, because every time somebody would gut somebody, the knife, and that was when they did 3D, like, right at your face. Mm -hmm. So the knife was right at us. We're like, ah, Jason stabbed us, and you jump down. And, I mean, it was, at the time, scary as hell. Now you watch it, man, shame on me. Shame on me for letting that work, because that's just (laughs) sad and poorly filmed and poorly edited. But... Uh, another one, she, she wanted to know creepiest children in film. Uh, my personal <laughs> creepiest child is Haley Joel Osment in Sixth Sense. Yeah. Fucker was always talking to dead people. How fun would that kid be? <laughs> Just creepy little bastard. Brian? He wasn't creepy. He was creepy. I see dead people. How is it not creepy? Well, okay, yeah, but it, you know, he's not creepy. Those two girls from The Shining were creepy. Yeah, was, since that was on my list. That smoker voiced girl from Pet Cemetery and her brother Gage, they were creepy. <laughs> Play with any, me. Yeah, any ginger kid from the Children of the Corn. <laughs> any ginger kid. Malachi was cool. Let's hang out with him. Whew. I, I don't know. For me personally, though, the, uh, the, probably just the creepiest of them all would be uh, the original Damien from The Omen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good call. That kid just it was evil. Evil looking, Scotty. Uh, he stole mine a little bit with The Shining. It had the red rum kid. Was that was kind of creepy, a little cheesy, but that, that you didn't know he was. Rah, 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 yeah, creepy. but but when he's like drooling on himself and everything, he's like. <laughs> <laughs> and, Scotty uh, does that too. So. Yeah, he's doing it right now. Justin mentioned it already, but uh, the little girl from Poltergeist. That that you know the whole we're, they're here. That was that was creepy, and I and I mentioned the ring as well. But uh, Samara was creepy as hell. The whole seven days. Yeah, I was, man, that movie still gets, creeps me out to this day. It was a good one. Justin? Uh, Brian mentioned Gage. That was probably, uh, whenever I think creepy kids, he's probably the first one to jump into mine. But I got to go with the easy pick on this one. Regan McNeil from The Exorcist, of course, played by Linda Blair. The things her parents let her do in that film, Mm -hmm. even as not a parent, I'm like, how the fuck did you let your daughter (laughs) do this shit and she did most of that stuff oh god that's actually i'm probably one of the few people on the planet that doesn't like the exorcist really yeah i just i don't get anything out of it my mom i think it's i think it's her favorite horror movie i just don't get anything out of it i've watched it you're wrong so often so it's (laughs) starts to get old after a while yeah Yeah. okay and our wrap-up topic our favorite movie villain who is your favorite movie villain and most most importantly why you know, of all of them, I'd probably have to say Pinhead. Oh, really? There is something about the Hellraiser movies that have always creeped me out because so much of what these people do, they do it to those who kind of are asking for it. Yep. So, yeah, I'd have to go with, with Pinhead and, and the the Lament configuration box. Ooh, he Scotty. stole mine, man. He stole mine. Oh, it's your favorite. Oh. It's your favorite. It really is. But I, I had to give honorable mention to the. Uh, um... Oh, you're doing a macumber. Well, he stole mine, so. <laughs> We're calling it. <laughs> if he's gonna steal it, I'm gonna get another oh, one in there. Right. Um, Pyramid Head from Silent Hill, which uh, not just because it's a video game, but uh, that that character was not shown enough in the Silent Hill movie, which is kind of why I want to see the new one. But there's something about a faceless dude with a. Why does he have a pyramid on his head? Why does he have this big machete thing? It's just really creepy. I like that. But <laughs> okay. Hopefully he'll be raping mannequins in the second one. <laughs> Brian? As much as the movies really need to be stopped being made, mm-hmm. uh, Leatherface, the dude's just a really bad product of bad parenting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so he <laughs> so reminds you a lot of your hometown. I was about to Basically, say he's... Yeah. Yeah. Brian's like there, but the grace of God go I. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine is Jason Voorhees, and I mean Jason Voorhees from like part two, three, and four, not from not in space, not in space. <laughs> yeah, 
<clears throat> I have no idea why. I don't. I don't know why. There's nothing redeeming about him. He's just a big giant monster killing machine. He's silent. His movies are all about the kills. He has no real character, no personality. But I fucking love the Friday the 13th movies. And, and I don't know why. There's something wrong with me for liking them so much, I'm sure. But I think it's because it's it's a horror movie at its simplest. And it's essentially saying, here's what you really, really came to see. How creative can the kills be? Uh, you know, you know these kids are all going to die. They're all going to die violently. Nobody can kill them. But the first couple movies that you saw, Jason, um, 2, 3, and 4 were freaking awesome. And and he was actually a, a creepy, scary character. He wasn't a joke at that point. Especially in, I think it was part two is my favorite. Because he was just, he, was, he wasn't quite this indestructible killing machine. He was just a real creepy, sadistic son of a bitch and loved it. Just loved it. I'm so, glad nobody said Freddy. No, well, Freddy became too much. He's too much of a yeah. joke. Too much of a yeah, he became way way too much about the the one liners, and really ruined the villain that the first film created. He's probably one of my most disappointed. Like everybody keeps raving about how what a great villain he's always been. You know what? He made it to the first movie. I'll give him that. You know, I thought the first movie was actually genuinely scary, up until probably the end when it just went off the rails a little bit. But the rest of them, he was just a—he was more of a joke than he was a villain. All right, let's close it up. Let's go into emails. Justin, you got an email from Paul. Paul says, Chasing Amy, I believe is the correct answer. And, of course, we know that Paul is right. I love Kevin Smith's movies. I was also curious if any of the show watcher, uh, if anyone on the show watches Alphas on sci-fi and what your thoughts are on it. I think of all four of us, I'm probably the only one who saw the first season. And I enjoyed it, but I never really felt like sci-fi delivered on the premise that they gave, which was that Alphas was going to be a show about people who had abilities that could theoretically happen in the real world, whether it was enhanced strength granted through adrenaline or... um you know, people with synesthesia being able to interpret smells and sights and sounds in, in different ways. Uh, I, that seemed like an intriguing premise, but really what we got, to me anyway, was Hero's Light. None of these people had abilities that could really ever appear in the real world in the ways that they're doing it, especially when you get to the kid that can see wireless communication i mean i don't care how jacked up your brain is you're not going to see the stuff floating through the air and then be able to manipulate it and twist it and so i was a little let down that that premise wasn't adhered to that said i actually enjoyed the first season of alphas i the second season is out and i think it's still currently airing uh, i have not watched it yet only because i've got so many other shows to watch but i will return to it uh, i do though think that of the superhero tv shows Heroes was a much better show, and I think Heroes got unfairly bashed after that amazing first season. Uh, I think it, it kind of continued to be pretty strong through to the end. But Alphas is a good show, and if you got sci-fi and you want something with some superheroes, but not all the whiz-bangery that Heroes had, it's, it's a good show to watch. Okay, and this comes from Sue S. <laughs> it's funny because she sent us two emails, and uh, one we were talking about The Walking Dead last week, so you'll understand why. First one is, how about a monthly Walking Dead spoiler cast for us folks who got ass-raped by Dish? <laughs> <laughs> got the time and inclination to watch two television shows, Breaking Bad and The Walking Dead, and what happens <laughs> denied by the greedy sons of bitches at AMC and Dish? Fuck, fuck, fuckity, fuck. Well, as, wow. as, Sue, Hang on. as Sue probably knows by now, Can I finish? Dish just got an agreement worked out, and AMC is right now back on Dish. <laughs> Let me finish. Get a finish. Get, Get a finish. Get a finish. <laughs> okay. God damn, Brian, you fucked the whole thing up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, and this comes from Sue S. She says, then there's two emails and you'll find out uh, why in a second. The first one is we were talking about Walking Dead last week. She says, how about a monthly Walking Dead spoiler cast for us folks who got ass raped by Dish? Got the time and inclination to watch two television shows, Breaking Bad and The Walking Dead, and what happens? Denied by the greedy sons of bitches at AMC and Dish. Fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. If Lori goes down like she did in the graphic novels and I don't get to view it with my own two eyes, well, damn it all anyway. Snoogans ho, Sue. And then later she says, Brian, what happened between that email and this email? Motherfucker, you better say something. (laughs) 
I'm sorry, I shut up. <laughs> As I was instructed to by my fearless leader. <gasps> Sounded more like an order to me, but, you know, whatever. What happened? Uh, Dish did reach an agreement with AMC, and we have, uh, I have Dish now, actually. It's, I'm kind of liking it. I like it a little, some ways a little bit better than DirecTV, especially now that AMC is back on, so... It's uh, they worked out an agreement, and AMC is back on, so we can have Walking Dead and Mad Men and all that, all that stuff. So, yay, <clears throat> yay! And then Sue followed up with an email that says, "Hey, it's back, AMC, it's back. It's a miracle. This is a true testimony of the power of a sternly worded email sent to the hose. Whatever you did, can you do it again to George Lucas? Get him to leave Indiana Jones alone. It's going to be the end of Harrison Ford if they push through for a rumored number five. Yay, Sue. Well, Sue, you're welcome." That's, that's all I got to say. I'm, I'm sure Brian pushed it through. So you can always find us at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Stay through the credits for outtakes. Facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Um, please take a, a listen. You're going to hear a Paranormal Activity spoiler cast in the next few days. So if you haven't listened to that yet, be sure to look for it. Tell your friends. Subscribe on iTunes, Zoom, Google Reader. Listen to your Stitcher Radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you do, or just any plain old RSS feed. And RockfordCollegeRadio.com, Thursdays from 4 to 6. Thanks to each of the podcasters. Brian Williams, thanks for being here, buddy. Hey, enjoyed it. Did you? I really did. I had a freaking awesome time this evening. That's, Glad to be here. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I wish everybody could hear the behind the scenes <laughs> shit. <laughs> Scott Clark? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Yeah, and but... <laughs> <laughs> and Justin McCumber <laughs> aka Smedley <laughs> Justin thanks for being oh, here oh people if only <laughs> if only you got to hear the shit that went on behind the <laughs> uh, come back next week we're going to review Cloud Atlas so that'll be exciting and more on the next Hollywood Outsider and remember from all of us the next time you go to a theater Buy popcorn. Manamana. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> How do I sound, ladies? Um, come a little closer. Don't be shy. <laughs> Who the fuck is whistling like a Disney fucking bluebird? <laughs> like, look at that magical, majestical horse. I want to ride it. Yeah, more like a Shetland pony. <laughs> Focus. Other Paranormal Activity Focus. 2, Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> what is he uh, reading? Don't worry about it. Okay. Just let him focus. Your mom if we start it. talking about... Just, look, look, he's getting in there. Now you've done it. It's, it's like Beetlejuice all over again. Oh, Justin, Justin, Justin. Justin gets excited when he hears his own name. That's what I mean. It's like talking about himself in the third person. I bet you when he's in the bedroom, he does that. You like what Justin does? You like it? (laughs) This is the Hollywood Outsider, a weekly entertainment podcast, where this week we are looking at upcoming releases, Flight, Man with the Iron Fist, and Wreck-It Ralph. We're going to have a spoiler-free review of Paranormal Activity 2. Our From the Outside In topic this week is a few listener Halloween suggestions. We're going to have... What? It's Paranormal Activity 4, not Paranormal Activity 2. Did I say 2? Yeah. Motherfuck. <laughs> yeah. Not only did you miss it by 1, you missed it by 2. <laughs> I mean, but good on you, though. I mean, if you're going to do it, do it right. Really fuck it up there, Turbo. <laughs>